it's so good to see you here with us today. And um, beautiful worship tonight. Thank you, worship team. We just were taken into the heavenlies tonight. Hallelujah. So encouraging. May God bless you and increase and multiply your gifts. So just want to appreciate you before I start. Um, this topic, Beauty for Ashes, has been rolling around in my spirit for actually several weeks. And the ladies' prayer already benefited <laughs> From that word, and we had a wonderful prayer meeting uh, last week. Um, and I just want to cover this word in the Holy Spirit and in prayer before I begin. Father, we thank you for this night. We thank you for this word, Father, a Rhema word for the season that we are in now. Lord, use this word to build faith. Use this word to strengthen us, Lord, because you said your people are called from strength to strength. And so, Lord, I pray uh, that you would strengthen us, that you would encourage us, uh, that your word would speak to someone here today, Lord, and that most of all, Lord, it would do its deep and transforming work in our hearts in our minds, and in our spirits. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I believe God always wants to bring a prophetic word in seasons of calamity, specifically when we're going through the dark hour that has come to the world at such a time as this. That word came through the prophet Isaiah, and he spoke into the nation at a time when people's hopes were kind of at the bottom. <laughs> they had been come, they came back from exile from Babylon. And when they came back home, they found a ruined city, a people who had been enslaved for many years. And it was a difficult situation. Um, it is a voice that we hear in this passage from Isaiah that speaks of a new day. It speaks of a new beginning. And the Lord here wants to give us a voice of hope in the midst of the darkness, in the midst of this pandemic, which seems to consume all our attention these days. Um, the statement that God comes to his people throughout history to revive their hope is a repeated theme throughout the Old Testament and culminates in the coming of Jesus Christ. Um, but he's also looking to prepare a new generation. You see, this season is calling for a new generation to take up the challenges and with his anointing and his wisdom to rebuild, restore, and renew what has been destroyed. And this is the message of Isaiah. And I want to go now to an event that happened in 1980 that I was very familiar with. Mount St. Helens eruption in Washington State in May 18, 1980. I was in southern Alberta at that time, expecting my second child, staying on my parents' farm. They had gone off for four months to take uh, care of a hunting lodge in the far north. And I was there on my own. And I remember on the night of the 18th, I saw this massive cloud coming from the southwest. And I thought, that's a strange cloud. What is that? It was unique. It wasn't like a normal cloud. But in the morning when I awoke, everything was yellow. The air was yellow. I could not see uh, even to the, the fence line in the front yard. And uh, I had no idea what had happened at that time. But ash, of course, was piling up. And the cows, as they plodded along through the ash, every time they took a step, a puff of ash would come up. They were covered with ash. And this beautiful mountain that blew up on that day um, we can see the before and the after pictures in the next slide. You see the before it was lush, there was lakes, there were forests, and after it was total devastation. And this devastation was very interesting to the scientists. They wanted to know how soon would life begin to rise up 
from the ashes. And it's a challenge for us here today um, in our own lives, if we feel that our lives are in ashes, I just want to say that God is going to do something new, which you would never expect. In less than two years, the first plant life spotted rising out of the ashes was this alpine uh, lupin flower. One rose up on the right, and the scientists were amazed that only two years after this absolute devastation, when everything had been turned to ash, here was this little flower growing up. And now, as you can see today, it's flooded with these beautiful flowers as life comes back to this mountain. I want to say that we are in a situation and in a day where many people feel like this is what's happened to their world. <laughs> They've lost what they knew. They've lost jobs and visas. Loved ones have been lost. Family members have been lost. And uh, it's not over. We're in the middle of it. <laughs> but I want to say that God is going to make beauty out of our ashes. He's going to make something arise that's new, that's fresh, that's anointed. And so I want to encourage you with that word. And I want us all to stand at this time. As we're going to read together Isaiah 61. We've got it on the overhead. Let's all stand up. And we're going to read this portion of scripture as Isaiah the prophet is speaking to us today. The spirit of the sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. They will rebuild the ancient ruins and restore the places long devastated. They will renew the ruined cities that have been devastated for generations. Thank you. You may be seated. May the Lord bless this word and make it a reality today in each one of our lives. Well, Isaiah was the son of Amos, and he prophesied during the reign of Isaiah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And we know that he didn't always have favorable kings. Ahaz was not uh, a good king. <laughs> he was a wicked king, and he saw good kings, and he saw wicked kings in his day. His call and anointing came in Isaiah 6, when he realized that God was calling him, but he realized he was a man of unclean lips, and he cries out as he senses this call of God, and God calls him, and he says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. And when he makes that statement, an angel goes to the altar of God and picks up a coal off the altar and brings it and touches Isaiah's lips so that his lips would be clean. His lips would be consecrated to the word of the Lord and to the mission and commission that he had. And we remember in the throne room, Isaiah is standing there and he's hearing the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit speaking. And they're they are talking. And the, the talk is, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I want to say, Isaiah stood up and he says, here am I, Lord, send me. 
And I want to tell you that in every generation, God is looking for someone to send. He's looking for someone to consecrate and anoint and to send with his word. A word that will transform, that will bring hope, that will change the situation for the better. And I want you to know today, his eyes are still roving throughout the earth, looking for those who will serve him. Serve him in spirit. Serve him in truth. His eyes are still looking today for people to serve him. Well, Amos had a fa- I mean, um, Isaiah had a family. We know that. He had a son named Shir Jashob, and he had another son, Mahir Shalal Hashbaz, That's a long name, but that long name actually was given as a prophetic sign that Israel was going to conquer and that their enemies were going to be defeated by the Assyrians. And it means hurry, hurry to the plunder, hurry to the victory. Hallelujah. It's a season, my friends, where God is looking for people to get busy hurrying to the victory. <laughs> we all think we're, we're all locked down. It seems like almost a paradox, but I want to say that God often works in reversal mode in seasons like this. And so he's come to bring a prophetic word, a prophetic statement. 700 years before Jesus Christ was born, he makes this prophetic announcement, announcing the good news of the the favor, the year of the Lord's favor. Hallelujah. This is our God. And I want to tell you, there are prophetic things happening even now. We got recently, just a couple of days ago, a dream from a young man in this congregation. He was given a dream so close to being right out of the book of Daniel. And it was in the Aramaic, the ancient Aramaic language. And we're, we're, we're praying about this and trying to decipher this dream. But it's a message. It's a message to the church. Hallelujah. This is how the Holy Spirit is working. He's using young people, old people. He's pouring his spirit out at this season as Joel prophesied. Hallelujah. So here we see Jesus Jesus uses this very scripture that we just read to announce the beginning of his ministry. And I want us just to go into our Bibles. I didn't put it up there, but I want us to go to Luke 4 and see Jesus' own pronouncement using this scripture to launch forth his ministry. It's in Luke 4, beginning at verse 14. And we'll just take a minute to read it. There are some slight differences in this. But I want us to start at 14 to give you the context when Jesus speaks this word out of Isaiah. He takes the word. He owns this word as the person to fulfill this prophecy given 700 years before. Does God have a plan for your life? Amen. It was planned at the beginning of time, 700 years before uh, Isaiah prophesied. So reading from verse 14, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue as was his custom, and he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him, all planned by God. (laughs) Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. I want to say in the synagogue, everybody knew this 
messianic prophecy. Everybody knew about this prophecy. Everyone at that time was waiting for Jesus to come. And fortunately, as you read further, you see they actually rejected Jesus at this time as we read on a little bit further. But what I want you to note is that Jesus comes, it says, he returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit. Where had he just come from? If you flip over to chapter 4, he was in the desert being tempted. <laughs> There's no anointing without the test, my friends. Are you feeling like you're in a test? <laughs> This is probably one of the greatest tests, and it's not just only individual, it's national, it's families, it's international, it's a global test for all believers at this hour. We are in the test, and it is a desert, let me tell you. We're just starting to come back now. We've been cut off from worshiping together. We've been cut off from fellowship. We've been isolated. And I want to tell you at this time in the fire, God is refining the gold and the silver and the diamonds at this moment to see who is he going to rebuild with? Who is he going to use to build his temple up? It's the silver. It's the gold and the diamonds. Because the latter temple is going to be greater than the former. Hallelujah. He's looking for you and me. And he's looking for the quality of the people that he is going to use to rebuild, restore his uh, church once again. So you're in a good place. Hallelujah. You're being squeezed. You're being pressured. I want to tell you, diamonds are not formed any other way but under pressure. <laughs> Extreme pressure. They need that pressure to shine. So as we see this, Jesus owned this prophetic word. He owned it. He spoke it. He said, this is mine. And I want to tell you today, if we're going to shine like the diamonds, <laughs> we need to own the word of God for ourselves. Hallelujah. We need to own it. How do we own it? Deuteronomy tells us, think upon it, talk about it, teach it. We've got to own the word. We've got to say, wow, Lord, that word is for me today. That's a rhema word. I take that word for me today, and that word is mine. And we, we memorize that word. We, we go over that word. We dig that word. We mine it for everything that is in it because that word was for you. Hallelujah. And that word has a transforming effect, but we have to own the word like Jesus owned that word. The next thing we see is that this is all about the declaration of God's kingdom reign. Because Jesus said, I've come to preach the good news. I've come to proclaim the good news of the kingdom. And what will it be like? What is that kingdom going to look like? I think it's going to look a lot different after COVID than it did before COVID. I like what Brother or Elder Ajit says, um, BC, before COVID, AC, after COVID. <laughs> We've got a, a new way to mark our lives, and really, we really can point to that. B.C. and A.C., we know there's going to, this marked the globe. It marked the globe. No one is exempt from this marking. Um, this will be a work of the Spirit, hallelujah. This is, this is a work of the Spirit. Zechariah 4, 6 says, Not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And then he says, What are you, O mighty mountain? And he, sa he, he, he says this word, What are you? There was a mountain there. And he, he looks at it, What are you, O mighty mountain, before me? What are you, obstacle? What are you, COVID? <laughs> what are you? And he says, the word of the Lord is going to flatten you out. The word of the Lord is going to get rid of you. And so I want to say every, every mountain that is coming into our life at this time, and there are many people having to climb many different mountains, but the word of the Lord says that with his word, we will go through. We will go through, and we're not going to go through just ho-hum. We're going to go through with victory. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. So we need to receive the anointing, to receive the promise of this Holy Spirit. It comes on one we know now because of the test. So we're in the test. Hallelujah. We're set up. We're ready for this word of God. And I want to tell you, the word is eternal. It's invisible. What is invisible, what is unseen, is eternal. What is seen is temporary. But this word, Matthew 24, 35, says, Heaven and earth will pass away, but my word will never pass away. Isaiah 40, verse 8, The grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of God stands forever. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one little tittle. That means one little tiny mark in the word of God to fail. Hallelujah. That's how sure the word of God is. And so we need to stand on this. The word of God abides forever. Hallelujah. So let's put our confidence in the word. Let's own it. Uh, let's digest it. Let's eat it. Jesus said, unless you eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, you can have no part of me. What the flesh, what Jesus said, the word became flesh. Jesus became flesh. When we consume this word of God, we are intaking, we are digesting God's word and making it internally our own. So we see that this test Jesus passed the test. The anointing, he owned the anointing of God that came upon him. And he came up and he declared it with such courage. There's a new courage when the Spirit of God's on you. <laughs> In the Old Testament, when the Spirit of God came upon the Old Testament prophets, like we think of Samson, he became like so super strong because the Spirit of God came upon him. It's the same Spirit operating now, as was operating then, God wants to pour out a spirit to give us what? Overcoming spirits. To overcome the challenges of the day, the challenges of the hour. So yes, this anointing gave Jesus a mission. It was to proclaim the good news. And I want you to notice the things before the anointing. There were certain things existing before the anointing. They were brokenness. There were captives, there were prisoners, there was dust, there was ashes before the anointing. After the anointing, we get healing. Hallelujah. We find that uh, freedom comes for captives and prisoners uh, who are sitting in darkness. And this proclamation is the year of God's favor, his blessing, his vengeance against his enemies, and his comfort for those of us who are mourning and grieving. You know, I'm teaching right now a, a healing and trauma class. I've actually taught three of these courses over the last year and a half. And people are coming to this healing and trauma class to find restoration, to find hope, to find healing for the heart wounds that they have accumulated through life. You know, life does that. It hurts us. <laughs> There's lots of hurts as we travel through life. But God wants to bring restoration. He wants to bring healing where we've been wounded. Because hurting people hurt others. People who are healed can move on in the fullness that God has for them. So this is why we see now the actions of the kingdom. They're transformative. We look at the crown of beauty for ashes. There's an exchange. There's this divine exchange that God wants to perform in our lives. Beauty where there's only ashes. You may say, I don't feel very beautiful. <laughs> my spirit doesn't feel like that. I, 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 my situation doesn't feel like that. But God wants to do the divine exchange. He wants to put the oil of joy on us for mourning. You know, in the Old Testament, they poured it out to anoint uh, the kings. And uh, it was used also to, uh, as we remember, Mary, when she was followed Jesus into this house of this very rich, rich man. And the man was supposed to greet Jesus with a kiss. He was supposed to wash his feet. And he was supposed to put oil on his head. That was standard greeting. It was the social custom of the day. 
But this rich Pharisee so despised Jesus, he didn't do one of those things. And so this woman who had been delivered from several demons came in and fell at Jesus' feet. And she performed all of these loving rituals with her tears. And she broke open her alabaster, beautiful oil perfume. And she put it on his feet and she dried his feet with her hair to show respect, to show honor where this rich man in his house did not give Jesus the proper welcome. It's the oil of joy. She was pouring out that oil on Jesus' feet with great joy, exulting in the opportunity to serve him. Then there's the new garments. We get clothed with praise, clothed with righteousness. Hallelujah. We get an exchange. <laughs> now, I know all of us ladies here, we like to get a new outfit. <laughs> but this outfit that God has for us outshines any outfit we could ever, ever purchase. It's a robe of righteousness and a robe of praise instead of despair. And um, this is what the word of the Lord is saying for us here today, that he wants to transform our season of grieving, of mourning, of despair. And he wants to put onto us that crown of beauty, the oil of joy, and these new garments of praise. And thankfully, we had a real experience of that anointing of the garments of praise in our worship service today. Anointing is the incoming of new power. And it is the property of all who submit to God and are responsive to his word. Who can own it? Those who submit to God and are responsive to his word. It doesn't come to anyone anyhow. Many are called, but few are chosen. Oh, we said, Lord, what does that mean? What does that mean? Many are called, but few are chosen. Everybody is given an opportunity to come into the kingdom. Everybody is given the opportunity. But when we don't respond to it, we miss it. We just simply miss it. It passes us by because we don't respond to it. And I think last week, uh, Pastor Gerald talked about that. We need to Grab hold of this wonderful anointing that God has for us. It's some people actually don't walk in its power. They don't, they deny its power because they don't allow it to transform them. They don't allow their actions to be transformed by the power of the word. If we don't respond, we're denying its power. It means it's not working in us. It has to work in us to do God's will and we're responsible to respond so we have a responsibility in this anointing and it is to respond to God's call and the purpose of this anointing is to bring transformation it's to change our status hallelujah it's to change our status and you know some of us here right now we want to change our status <laughs> Some of us are single. We want to get married. We want to change our status. Some of us are without a job. We need a job. We want to change our status. There's lots of things that we want to change. But I'm going to tell you the greatest change that can ever be affected in your life is through the transformation that comes through the word of God. Letting it transform your life. Asking God, help me, Lord. I need to be transformed. I need to change. I need to change my purpose. I need to follow. What are your purposes, God? And I can remember the day that God tapped me on the shoulder. And he said, uh, Pat. <laughs> hey, Pat. Very busy over there doing good things. Hey, Pat. Yes, Lord. I need you to do something. Oh, Okay, what's that, Lord? I need you to go over there. There's a Christian school down there, and they need your help. And I went, oh, no, 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 no. That's not for me. <laughs> I'm not doing that, Lord. Thank you for the call, but I'm not doing it. Two weeks, I was miserable. Two weeks. Absolutely miserable. Why? Because I hadn't responded to what God had called me to. It's not about what I feel. It's not about what I like. It's about God's divine plan. 
And when we step into his plan in faith, because I didn't feel like I had what it took, <laughs> when I just took a step of faith, like Peter, who got out of the boat, God just did something. He went before me. And, and, and just amazing things happened because I obeyed. And I was supposed to meet the people. I was supposed to meet the people that were there. I didn't know that. We can keep ourselves out of a lot of divine connection and new doors because we shut God's voice off. We don't respond to it. So I want to encourage you today, if God speaks to you, obey, because he's got something for you. He's got, he already knows the, the end from the beginning. Hey, he knew and gave a word to Isaiah 700 years before. I am sure he knows what's going to happen to you tomorrow. So yes, plans, my priorities, my goals, they had to change when God called me. <laughs> and, and I had to let him. And sometimes I didn't like it. But at the end of the day, whenever I gave up and surrendered to God, I found amazing, amazing things that he did through my life, in my life. The other thing is God wants to give you a new name. Wow, I like this one. Oaks of Righteousness. You know, some of us don't like the name we were given when we were born. <laughs> um, I had a nickname I really disliked. And... Um, I had to tell people when I got to be 12, I don't want to be called that name. I want to be called by my real name. And I'm blessed with a real name that has a good meaning in it. But sometimes we want to change our name. And I want to say God has a new name for you. It's called Oaks of Righteousness. When we respond, he plants us. Hallelujah. He plants us and he displays his glory through us. He displays his wisdom through us simply because we've responded to him. And uh, the Romans called this oak tree, they had a name for oak and it was called Rober. And this denoted strength and flexibility. And as we know, oak is very, very valued for using to make furniture. Isn't that something? Beautiful, tall, strong, useful, and it's used to mature wine because its chemical composition does something to the wine when it's pulled, poured into it and it's stored. It makes it better. It matures it. And that's God's plan for us, is maturity in Christ. To be these oak trees where people can come and get shade and, and get nourished and uh, find comfort um, and this is part of this whole development of the call of God. When we respond, he has a plan. And one of the plans is to make you a oak tree of righteousness. Hallelujah. <laughs> I love that idea. Righteousness as an oak tree. Well, the next thing I want to say is that there's a purpose for this righteousness. God clothes us with it. He plants us. We begin to grow like these oak trees, but there's purpose in that. And the purpose is in the last verse that we read in uh, <clears throat> verse 4. It's to rebuild ancient ruins. You see, God is very, very interested in rebuilding. Rebuilding what has been wasted and what is destroyed. Now, some of you may have different types of devastation. I had some family devastation in my life. And it needed to be rebuilt. I didn't know, Lord, how am I ever going to restore this thing? I had to wait 15 years. I thought, why, God, 15 years to restore this devastation in my family? But you know what? God was preparing me. He was preparing me so that on that very day when I got the phone call, that this was the day of restoration, I jumped for joy. I wept and I wept and I wept because it took 15 years. It was wasted time. But God just said, seize the moment. And that whole situation turned in that amount of time. Just within a few hours, everything that the canker worm had destroyed in my family for 15 years was restored. <laughs> That's God's spirit, my friends. That's what God wants to do in your life. That's what he wants to do in your family. That's what he wants to do in your church. That's what he wants to do in your community. That's what he wants to do in this nation. We all know, we all know 
the devastation that we faced in these different areas. And the nice thing is it's rebuilding, it's restoring. Hallelujah. It's this restoring. I love God. He always wants to restore. He always wants to rebuild what's ruined. Um, and, and he wants to renew generations. Hallelujah. You were the key to the next generation. Each one of you here, you're the key to the next generation. God is a generational God, and his promises are generational. They're not just for us. They're for our children's children. And if you read down uh, in Isaiah, if you just go down a few verses to verse 9, we see this generational promise coming out. So I'm back in Isaiah 61, and I'm going to read this verse. Their descendants will be known among the nations. He's talking about you and me, the oaks of righteousness. Their descendants will be known among the nations and their offspring among the peoples. All who see them will acknowledge they are a people the Lord has blessed. Hallelujah. So the idea of blessing is never for ourselves. It's generational. It's so that we can sow this blessing into the next generation. And when our families see us being the ones that restore our family relationships, when they, we, they see us moving in to make sure that justice happens in our community, well, I tell you that you're leaving them a legacy. You're leaving them footsteps that they will walk in. They will become the oaks of righteousness for the next generation. And so I want to say for some reason, at this season, at this time, God has allowed COVID to come like this. Why? Like I said, diamonds, gold, rubies are being processed right now, each one of you. But it's not just for you. It's so that you can leave a legacy for your children and your children's children. In fact, uh, you can look these up. There's a lot of them. But Deuteronomy 7, 9 says, My love extends to a thousand generations of those who love me. Ooh, I love that. You can look it up in Psalm 105, verse 8, Exodus 20, verse 6, 1 Chronicles 16, 15. All are promises, generational promises to those who respond to God's call, who obey his word, take him at his word, and step out in faith. And this is a generation that will make the changes. They will solve the problems of pandemics in the future. <laughs> How do you get known? How do we get known? We get known when we stand up, when we solve the problems of the world. We need, we need more Einsteins. <laughs> we need more John Newtons. We need more Amy Carmichaels, who went into India and tried to change the whole system there of child prostitution in the, in the temples. We need more Hudson Taylors that went into China in faith to bring the gospel these are the people that we need in the next generation. And so I want to say, people today, that God has a purpose. He has a hope for you. And that hope and that purpose is as you respond to his call, as you respond to the anointing, as you own the word of God, he is going to raise up you and your generation to solve the issues of this world, this fallen and broken world. So may the Lord bless this word to you. May you be encouraged today. That this righteousness, this righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ has a generational impact that will go through a thousand generations of your family. Let us close our eyes in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this word today. We thank you for the transforming power of your word today. Thank you, Lord. Help us to own it, Lord. Help us to own the word. Help us to walk in it. Help it to transform us. Help it to change us, Lord, in the innermost parts of our being. Anoint us, Lord, so that, Father, we can speak to the current generation, so that we can raise up a new generation who will do great exploits for you. Father, I pray you'd encourage each person today that may be suffering from broken relationships. Lord, you want to heal those wounds. You want to touch them. You want to transform them. You want to heal what the enemy has broken and stolen 
and try to destroy. And so, Father, we just release your healing word today. Father, may your anointing, Father, fall upon each person here today struggling with these situations, Lord. And so we commit this word to each person today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.